Great. Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. <laughs> Luke 23. Let's go there today. Luke 23. <clears throat> and this whole section, uh, <clears throat> whole section of Luke 23 deals with, <clears throat> uh, deals with a scene as uh, uh, Jesus is being crucified or getting ready to be crucified. Actually, it leads up to um, Jesus being crucified, and it's uh, Luke's uh, description of his uh, being handed over to Pilate and some of the events that happened just before his being handed over to Pilate, and then Pilate sort of like, you know, uh, uh, his his handing off. I'll, I'll go through this in a second. But his sort of ha- handing off. What's what's he going to do with with Jesus? And his handing them sort of over to the crowd. And then what's the, what's the crowd's demand going to be? And in the midst of all of that, <clears throat> I'm just going to pull out uh, what what Jesus says actually on the cross. Once we get him to the cross, and I don't mean to be you know kind of flippant about all these details, but <clears throat> Because uh, it is rather rather serious, uh, probably the most serious thing. But in verse 34 of Luke 23, it says, But Jesus was saying, uh, Father, forgive them. And I, <clears throat> I think it's important that you note here, <clears throat> Jesus was saying, in other words, he keeps saying this. He keeps saying this. So, <clears throat> meaning, he had been saying this. He was saying this throughout. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So uh, this morning, and this isn't exactly an easy kind of thing to talk about or to prepare for that, for that matter, but um, yeah, yeah, how do you look at forgiveness? How do you look at the idea of forgiveness? How do you forgive people? How do you do that? Mm, wow. You know, because uh, you're going to have times in your life, um, recent or, or more uh, in the past or yet to come in the future when somebody's going to do you wrong, right? Somebody's going to, you know, something of whatever nature is going to happen to you. <clears throat> and how do you, how do you, um, how do you deal with that? You know, how do you, how do you forgive? And uh, how, how do you understand that in terms of like God's forgiveness, God's forgiveness of us, you know, ultimately? And then you, you look, looking at this where Jesus is saying, uh, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they what, what they are doing. Um, you know, so some people look at this actually as a prayer. You know, I find it interesting. Um, what is this? Oh, this is Jesus praying and asking the Father to do something. Hmm. Well, <laughs> if I'm translating it, which hey, I'm able to do that. So if, if I'm translating this from the original language, this is actually a command. It's actually a command. So uh, my, my little title up here, if you see it, if you can see it on the screen in back of me, you can't probably on the video because I'm blocking it. <laughs> if you, uh, it will say a demand from the cross, which is in fact what it is, because this is an imperative. He's, he is actually demanding something of his father. Forgive them, period. Forgive them, for they, for they do not know what they are doing. And he keeps saying this, keeps saying this, keeps saying this. Again, we don't have audio. We don't have video of the scene. And so we don't know the intonation of the voice, in other words. We don't know how it's being said. We only, we only know the excruciating agony of the cross and the one who is hanging there and uh, how he must be saying this, but repeatedly, 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 repeat, repeatedly, uh, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, this, this kind of thing. <clears throat> so let's trail back over uh, ever so briefly, but trying to set this in its context and things of this nature and talk about forgiveness <clears throat> in this light and specifically God's forgiveness, his forgiveness of them. But here's one last ditch effort um, we see in, in chapter 23 going all the way uh, back to the beginning here. And I'll sort of recount the details for you uh, that is one last this effort by the Roman uh, a prefect Pontius Pilate to release Jesus to the bloodthirsty Jewish mob. 
And this uh, sort of resulted with the murderous insurrectionist Barabbas. If you remember, here's Barabbas, and he's now able to stroll the streets free. So at the same time Jesus is hanging on this cross, you have this vile kind of murderer, you know, um, I, I don't know what you want to call him, but Barabbas is, is able to go free. And you have from the crowd, this is 23, uh, 21, uh, when Pilate says, well, what are we to do with this Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, well, the crowd is yelling back, what? Crucify him, crucify him. <clears throat> and here we find it back in the context in verse 2, they begin to uh, accuse him, saying uh, that just these, these people with their trumped-up charges, forbidding to pay taxes. You know, well, he hasn't been, been paying taxes uh, he proclaims himself to be king, things of this nature. Nothing convincing enough really for Pilate to risk political disaster and mayhem on the streets of Jerusalem, uh, which he just happens to be in Jerusalem at the time all this is taking place. So he hands him over uh, to Herod, that is Jesus, over to Herod. It's kind of this, uh, well, the, an enemy of, of uh, my enemy is my friend sort of thing because Pilate and Herod, they really don't get along, you know, and uh, so, but this looks like a time for political alliances, and wow, do, do, are we not seeing any of this in our headlines today and some of the stuff that's, that's going on, right, not to, not to get into that mess, um, but uh, in the words of, of uh, Luke, uh, you look at chapter 23 and verse 25, just r ramming through this pretty quickly because we've got a lot of ground to cover, but it says, Pilate delivers Jesus over to, after they say, crucify him, crucify him, what does it say? He delivers them over to the will of the people. I think that's a pretty interesting thing to say. But what I want you to notice here um, also is this word, and in, in this translation, which is a New American Standard, which I would agree with at this point, not and he delivered Jesus to their will, but 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 he delivered Jesus to their will, this adversative, you know, um, but he did this. So um, there's this sense that, you know, here, here is a, here, there's consequences to decisions, you know, extreme consequences to their decisions. They had a choice, you know, and so, so what did they do? They, they choose, so they had an opportunity really uh, to, um, you know, allow Pilate to at least uh, as, y utilize some clemency, or at least, you know, I don't, I don't really know what, where this came from. Probably during the intertestamental period, this, this developed maybe during the Hasmonean dynasty or something. They, they were doing this kind of clemency or what, maybe to have favor with the Jews. I, I really don't know where all this came out of, but somehow it got established, and now Pilate was trying to do it uh, yet again, and they said, oh, oh, give us Barabbas, if you can imagine that, where they had an opportunity, um, and, and now, now Jesus uh, is, is, is passed over in favor of, of Barabbas. And so, but, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Um, so the indignities are, are immense, I mean, if you're, if you're Jesus. I, I say this within some context, right? The context being father forgive them not not um oh would you please you know or something this is a, this is a demand right for forgive them and he keeps saying this forgive them forgive them and you think the the indignities are immense this is all taking place on the most uh public stage you know and you go back to matthew's gospel which luke doesn't mention this but the scourging in Matthew 27, 26, then stripping him of his clothes to robe him and crown him with thorns as king so as to mock him. This is Matthew 27, 28 through 32, before leading him through the streets, heralding his crimes. If you look at Luke 23, 38, farther down now, there was an inscription above him. Do you see that? Like where they put Put the two pieces, the cross beam and the and the the upper beam and the patabellum, the 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 part where they would have nailed him to, and then they raised it up and, and hung him there. Above it would have been the the what's called the titulus in in Greek, uh, or in, sorry in in uh, in Latin, and this would have been his crimes. So 
that they would have, have somebody, as he was paraded through the streets, holding this sign saying, here's his crimes, this is what he's guilty of. And you remember it said, king of the Jews, right? And they said, uh, and, and so they were saying, no, no, we wanted to read, he said he was king of the Jews. No, 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 no. Just to rub it in further to the Jews, say, king of the Jews. So this was his crime, king of the Jews. And then that's what's nailed, that's what's nailed up top. And so when you're crucified, your crimes are nailed up, up top, and this is what it is. There is an inscription above him. This is the king of, of the Jews. All of this quite publicly. Can you imagine, right? So they, they drape you in this robe. They, they put this crown of thorns and the blood running down your face after they've scourged you, after they've spit on you and slapped you and mocked you and, and, and all these things paraded you through the, the streets announcing your crimes and nailed you to this and all of these indignities um, and all this, all this before the final act uh, of, of, I should say, the final act of extreme and insufferable indignity that is being crucified as an enemy of the state, a social outcast, a threat to decent society, one to be exposed naked before the world. Yes, naked before the world, ridiculed by all, befriended by none, preferred to die above a murderous insurrectionist by, by, by God-fearing Jews of one's own race. Um, let me just point you to that so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, John chapter 1, and I'll read it for you if you want to go there, but John chapter 1, in his prologue in verse 11, it says, he came to his own, and those who were not his own did not receive him. If you remember, he came, into, he came to his own, and his own um, did not receive him. If you remember that, that little turn of phrase, that is speaking of the word or, or Jesus. He came unto his own, that is his, his own things, things that has created, and his own, that is his own race, did not receive. Actually, it's the same idios. It's the same term used on, on both occasions, but understood in this sense, his, his own in terms of his own due to uh, his own possessions, that is his own due to creation. Chapter one and verse three, all things came into being through him and by him nothing exists, right? And the second his own by familial relation, that is to say his own kind, that is his own people, his own race did not did not receive him. And so here, here, here's this sense of crushing um, degradation, to use this. We don't use that term a lot. But imagine being degraded. Have you ever felt that way? Like devalued or degraded? To be demoralized, to be humiliated? I don't know, it's like to be treated without value, like a non-person. Uh, you know, though, though in the case of Jesus here, uh, we say humiliated, but I, I, I see someone who's, who's humble, but no personal humiliation in the sense of himself being humiliated due to any... You know, you know we're humiliated only when we feel intense shame over doing something wrong, right? And so there isn't any attachment that, that Jesus would feel humiliated because he'd done something wrong. Uh, we see Isaiah 53 right here. Here's a man of sorrows. We see, we see that we're the ones that looked on him with degradation. I mean, we degraded him. He did not degrade himself. Um, all of this is eerily shades of, for example, the 55th Psalm and the whole 55th Psalm. And right in the middle part, verse 13, but it was you, a man, my equal, my companion and my familiar friend. We had sweet fellowship together. We walked in the house 
of, of God in the throng. And he's talking about someone close to him, very close to him, uh, doing him injury. And then in Matthew chapter 10, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, a man's enemies will be members of his own household. And the backstory is, is David and Absalom. And he, and he refers to 2 Samuel, um, you know, you could, you could look at the backstory, 2 Samuel um, 15 through 18. And the, the passage is, un, is uncanny there. And uh, so, uh, but, but there's, there's cases there of just, just treachery and of being um, uh, done in, let's say, by one's own relation, one's own family, which would be, you know, the most, the most heinous of, of acts. And so you, you, can, you can read, you know, 2 Samuel, and, and even, even beyond that, it's just, it's just interesting when you, when you look at a lot of that and you see, um, you know, how that, how that works its works its way out. And so um, here um, you, we, have, we have in all of this the collective disparity of our human experience when treachery uh, abounds, which is to say we can't wrap our heads around it. You know, we can't, we can't begin to understand it, such betrayal, but Jesus, Jesus simply uh, strapped a crossbeam to his back and then buckling under its weight, yielded it to, to Simon, you know, Simon of Cyrene before, uh, you, know, uh, you know, who bore it to uh, Golgotha where nails penetrated the most sensitive, you know, nerves of his body until the air, you know, finally constricted his breath and he released his spirit to the Father. So again, we look at Luke 23, 34, and this contrasting uh, little Greek particle, you know, but, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. So he is saying this repeatedly. So the tense indicates making numerous injunctions, which is what it is. If you understand the legal term, Injunction, an injunction, you know. Imagine, it's as though what they are doing is so incredibly uh, unjust so as to rouse a reaction from a loving father that would step in and do what? Not going to treat my son that way, right? Right? as if the son to say, no, no, forgive, no, forgive, right? I know this all sounds a little strange and it's all <laughs> trying to wrap your head around what's actually happening here, but, but this injunction, you know, stay your hand. As a matter of fact, if you were to Look over it, like if you say, is there any parallel here at all in Scripture? Is there any parallel? W would anyone have taken from this scene an example, you know, after the fact, taken from this scene an example? Like, like would this uh, scene been exemplary? Is this a one-off? Or would it have served as an exemplary, or an example, let's say, would it be exemplary for future occasions in the church that followed? And, and in fact, you see in Acts chapter 7, uh, a case with Stephen, a, a horrible case, actually, really. And you remember Stephen is one of the leaders in the early church, and you look at you know, verses 58 to 60 right in there. You can look at the whole thing where he's making this incredible speech uh, in his defense and really laying it on about the contribution of, of um, you know, going back into the history of ancient Israel and showing their <clears throat> uh, 
you know, their um, spirit, their um, uh, apostasy, their um, infidelity, spiritual infidelity, and then bringing them right up to the point of their complicity and the in the death of Christ and and so on. And then they're stoning him. And in verse 58, he says, when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul, which would be Saul of Tarsus or the apostle Paul, who's going to write half of the New Testament. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud, a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Now, the only difference being between that and what Jesus said is the tense in the Greek this is notable, very notable, if you want to check that one over there at table one, if you want to check the difference in the tense, because Jesus issues a command, whereas Stephen says it in the subjunctive. So Stephen is saying, sort of like, please, you know, may you, now, I know it doesn't say that in most of the translations, but if you are translating, you'd say, Lord, may, may you not let this sin, please, where Jesus is saying straight out, don't, don't do it. So um, we have to take this apart a little bit and get hold of uh, um, forgiveness or in the sense, how, 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 how can I let go or release someone in effect to pardon them? And doesn't that, doesn't that amount to an injustice if they've done, you know, something wrong or namely, namely to me? Well, well, no. I, I, you know, for, for a few reasons without going to a lot of depth here, but number one, we're not the ultimate judges. We don't decide those kinds of things, right? Um, because this is Matthew 7, right? This is basically Matthew 7, Jesus saying, you know, you're, you're not the judge. Um, we don't render justice unless we're acting in, as some civil government, you know, you know, government type of thing, which God certainly allows governments to do that. But God is the ultimate judge. And forgiveness, on the other hand, what forgiveness does for us is it releases someone from being held by us in contempt, you know, a state which can become detrimental to our spiritual lives, for us to hold such things in. So forgiveness releases the individual into the hands of God for his justice to be meted out. I mean, this is, this is what... What, what we do, rather than holding on to some ill will towards someone, we simply say, look, um, you've wronged me, but you're going you're gonna to have to deal with my defender. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to deal with, that's, that's, that's a matter between you and God now. I hand you over to him. You know, he is, he is my defender. And he is your judge, so I, I I hand you I hand you over into into his uh, courtroom. I, I give you somewhat of a, an example, if not an excellent example, from First uh, Peter uh, chapter two, and this would again uh, be the life of um, be the life of Jesus. And First Peter two and verse twenty one and following, for you have been called for this purpose. Peter says. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. An example. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, while being reviled. Now here's the example. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept what? entrusting himself to he who judges righteously. Now, see, here's your turn the other cheek. Here's your kind of, this is your, you know, point of retaliation thing. Look, I give it into the hands of the one who is my advocate. I give it, you're, you're just going to have to 
answer to the one who's my defender, the one who's my protector. So let's look at this in a, from a few different angles. I'd say the breadth of, first, the breadth of this forgiving pronouncement. It's interesting uh, to look at this in the light of Matthew 9, 1 through 8, which is basically Jesus making the case that he has authority, and what's not looking at that passage, but he, that he has authority to forgive sins on earth. I mean, Jesus says this directly, right? So why didn't Jesus just go ahead and forgive him directly? You know, why didn't he just say that, right? So there's that, that kind of thing, right? So he is stipulating the role, I think. Jesus is just stipulating, um, you know, and I, I think without going into a whole lot of length there, he's creating a scene and he is, he is basically now becoming that suffer it to be so to fulfill all righteousness that he said at his baptism. But he's stip stipulating this role that Paul writes about in Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. He's putting himself in this position of this emptied and obedient son who, um, guiltless of sin, became the object of God's wrath upon sin, taking our sin, uh, or in Paul's words, nailing them to his cross that we might go free. This is all happening here at this occasion. And uh, so he is fulfilling this role that will explain uh, this mediatorial role. And we'll explain that more uh, towards the end. But the scope of this demand of the father is vocal so it can be heard and it's repeated. He's in anguish. He's in torment. It takes into account so much more than the soldiers nearby, um, but also the assailants along the way and the captors and the conspirators. This demand of the father is as much uh, as releasing them into his hands to acknowledge their contribution in placing him on the path of fulfilling the father's most glorious purpose for humanity. You know, the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. So there had to be agents who would be human agents, in fact, who would be involved in doing that. Um, uh, look at uh, John chapter 7 and 17 and verse 1, and here's another command, another command, right? So here's another, this is we could say this is Jesus' high priestly prayer, so to speak, but here's another command where he says, Father, the hour has come, glorify, now that's a command, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. So here's a sense that I've done everything that you've demanded of me um, to uh, bring me to this point. And he is going to be betrayed he is then going to go to the cross. All of these will be complicit players in that regard, and yet all will be accountable for their um, role in this. Um, so uh, the very wrath of God poured out upon the Son by the Father against the collective sins of humanity, this is relentless towards those who are not covered by the redemptive mercies won for the believer, trusting in the atoning work of Christ. This is throughout Scripture. You know, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed, stands revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the, um, the, their, um, their unrighteousness, right? So... Um, and we see this throughout throughout Scripture. So uh, forgiveness then is our role that releases those who commit wrongs uh, against us, but it doesn't absolve anyone of their sinfulness against a holy a holy God. So any anyone. Uh, certainly Jesus was not absolving anyone in that moment of their ultimate sinfulness um, toward, toward God. Uh, he's simply um, putting them uh, in a position where they ultimately are uh, going to have to deal with the wrath of God uh, exposed um, against them. They ultimately have to repent 
the same way make themselves available of um, the mercy of God and the grace of God that's available in his atoning work that he's doing um, at the cross, at the cross there. Um, so, so we'll say more about that in a moment. But, but look, look secondly at this argument within the forgiving pronouncement, what he's saying here. Um, look again at the second portion of Jesus' forgiving demand upon the Father. He says, for they do not know what they are doing. This little Greek particle, uh, which we have in English, for, in this case, it's sort of like annexing a reason onto this. In other words, uh, Father, forgive them, and, and here's the reason why. In other words, it's like Jesus is saying, um, here's the demand, and now here's the reason. Now, I realize this sounds really technical and real clinical, and yet the scene is one who's hanging on a cross and suffering, and it's, 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 a, it's a horrible and the most pathetic scene possible that we can imagine for human experience. And yet, we're sort of entering into a courtroom here. And we have a judge, and we have an advocate. It, it's amazing, but we have a judge in God, and yet we have an advocate for humanity, you know, it's kind of hanging on a, on a cross here. And this idea that he's saying, forgive them, but then what? Because, stating a reason, he's creating an argument here. And he's becoming an, an advocate defending um, people that were sort of like defenseless, you know, um, you know, basically saying, well, they, they don't know what they're, they're doing um, at, at the time of the commission of the, of the, of the crime, you know, like, like, they don't know what they're doing. And you say, well, this isn't a ignorance of the law defense, is it? You know, like, like, what, what's your theory of defense here? In, in fact, they knew, they knew exactly what they were doing in, in, on one level. So you have to stop and think about this. Wait, wait a minute. What do you mean they, they didn't know what they were doing? What is it that they, what is it that they knew? You, you start thinking. And so you say, well, Caiaphas was the high priest in Jerusalem. That he considered the case of, of Jesus he regarded Jesus as a subversive, conspired with Roman authorities, played a role in turning Jesus over to Pontius Pilate for trial and execution. Yeah, he knew all that. So, so what did you know, Caiaphas? He knew all that. Uh, Pilate and Herod were both political opportunists. They seemed anxious to reach, rid Jerusalem and the region of any source of civil unrest, wanted to get rid of all that, uh, didn't want to draw Roman attention, didn't want Rome to see what was going on in this little postage stamp uh, part of the world. So we got to silence Jesus and his followers, whether by flogging or whether by execution. And then the soldiers treating Jesus so brutally are just following orders you mean to tell me they didn't know what they were doing? They say, hey, these have to be crucified. You know the process. You know the procedure. Oh, well, yeah, crucifixion. Uh, how do you do that again? How is that? Well, let's see. In 4 BC, you have uh, General Varus. Um, he gave them a little practice because they crucified 2,000 Jews. So I think they pretty well knew what they were doing by this point, right? So certainly those complicit in these vile acts knew what they were doing. They were executing an innocent man based on religiously fabricated and politically motivated charges. So we have to really look at that word, you know, in the Greek, this is oida, you know, this, this work, th this word, sorry, refers to a knowledge akin to perception a deeper sense of understanding. In other words, those involved in, this, in these heinous acts, which resulted in placing the Son of God on the cross to bear the sins of humanity and to secure our redemption, did so without knowing 
how their acts would serve this divine purpose. This is what they didn't know. So conversely, we would not say then, don't forgive them for what they know they are doing, right? Because such teaching then would fly in the face of Matthew 5, 38 to 40. You know, when somebody slaps you, slaps you, and the idea, you know, what Jesus said, turn the other sheet. You know, somebody slaps you, turn the other sheet. It sounds a little more violent than that. You know, it sounds like, oh, if somebody strikes you, turn the other, well, wait a minute, I'm going to strike them back, you know, like this. But actually, you know, the reference is to kind of public humiliation. It's, it's more like that, you know, kind of slap in public, and you've been publicly uh, humiliated, then so provoked, you know, just, just don't, don't retaliate. And then you go to Matthew 18, and it says, yeah, but, yeah, but what, <laughs> it's like one of his disciples stepped up and said, okay, 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 smart guy. So, so what happens if it's second or third or fourth? Or what, what, what about up to seven? Seven, and then Jesus comes back with what? You know, how about 70 times seven? How do you like them apples? You know, how about 70 times seven? You know, you, you forgive them. So Jesus, though, isn't speaking here about if somebody, you know, attacks your family or brutally assaults you or physically, you know, he's not talking about that. You know, he's talking about something of, of, of impacting your personal pride or, or, some, or something like that, you know. Um, but when attacks involve others, we're, we're bound to protect including our households, our communities, our, our nations, a defense is called for, and not some strict kind of pacifism. But we need to step back and imagine the scene here for a moment. Of note is this, this phrase, Jesus was saying in, in Luke 23, 34, to note that again. He's not merely just uttering, Father, forgive them once, and that's, and that's over and done with, but he continues to utter this repeatedly and to do so while being tortured and being in torment and he continued to do so while suffering hate and cruelty and attacks and abuse from those his demand intended to release from guilt imagine this and that's the essence of romans chapter 5 and verse 8 and again if you look at the original language you got to look at the original language in romans for while we were yet sinners, you know, for example, you have to back up. God demonstrated his love toward us in this, in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, these are um, participles. You know, they are, in, this is, while we were, in the sense we translate it, while we were still in the act of sinning. Hmm, oh, I have to do a better job than that. So this, this is contemporaneous in time. God is demonstrating his love for us while we are still sinning and Christ is dying. Boom, 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 boom. Like that. So here he is hanging on a cross and dying for us. And this God says, here's my demonstration of love. He's dying, you're sinning. He's dying, you're sinning. The very sins he's dying for, you are committing while he's dying for them. Um, this is the picture of Golgotha. This is the picture of what he's doing. And he's saying, forgive, forgive them, demanding it, demanding it. Forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. Now, it, this is the sense where, um, no, they're, they're not being absolved of, of, you know, given somehow eternal life against their will you know something this is not what's happening there this is simply this is simply saying you know don't 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 negate uh exclude from them their opportunity to repent and receive 
the provision for which I am dying, you know, uh, this, um, you know, uh, in the same way Stephen is, is, is uttering the same, the same prayer. Um, uh, they must come to God the same way anyone else does, by means of the cross. Um, they must receive um, and they must see Jesus for, for who he is. So this is part of the genius, I think, of everything that's happening there on that day. So think about that for a moment. Those soldiers, Pilate, any of them, must see Jesus for who he truly is. So this whole scene, that's the third thing we want to look at, this message, I think, that's uh, from this forgiving pronouncement. What, what's going on there? And so by repeating this call aloud to the Father, with whatever breath he has, Jesus made known to all from the cross that this was not some mere spectacle of public execution. That's what they're used to seeing. Ah, it's, it's execution day, everybody. Here's yet another. I mean, we tend to think in the modern world, hey, it's Easter Sunday, you know, it's that, it's that time of year again. It's the, it's the crucifixion and the resurrection. You know, it's that type of thing. As if to say, in all of human history, there was only one person, well, maybe three crosses, you know, and there were these three people, you know, one, one person in the middle and two on either side that were crucified in all of human history when there were thousands and thousands, I think 800 Jews on one day that were crucified, and I just mentioned 2,000. You know, this was, they were everywhere. This was the Romans' choice method of, um, of deterring, you know, deterring anyone who would oppose Rome. Let's crucify them and crucify them pub publicly. Um, and so here's Jesus. He's going to transform this whole event from, from being some mere, I say mere, public spectacle of execution to a place of sacrificial and lasting atonement. He's making this into this glorious event, you know, whether he's just going to mark this on their psyche. You know? So he's presenting himself as this mediator. Yeah, you know, what do he say in 1232? And I, if I be, this is John, John Scussel, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men, meaning all mankind, unto me. So this is him suspended between, between heaven and earth, between you know, the, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, and he being the, the sacrificial lamb, where John says, behold the lamb of God that takes away the, 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 the sin of the world. So here he is, this sacrificial lamb placed on the, 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 the place of sacrifice uh, as a mediator suspended between heaven and earth, the mediator, um, the only one who can help. And so his disciples then, they begin to herald forth this message after his resurrection. And this is what Peter, beginning on the day of Pentecost, begins to recount this whole history and says, you know, you, you Jews, remember this, you, you, you put him to death. And he, he is, he is both Lord and Christ. And the chills, their blood must have run cold. And it certainly did because um, they begin to cry out, you know, to their men, brethren, you know, what, what, what do we do? What do we do? You know, knowing, knowing that this one that they thought that they, took down from the cross and put into a tomb, is now raised and will come again, you know, as their judge. And so this idea that this work of redemption uh, has been finished and Jesus going to translate this, this whole event now into, you have a mediator in me and I am the mediator of forgiveness with the Father. This is not a, an, an execution but this is an atoning event, and if you want atonement for your sins, you will not get it through that temple over there. You will get it through me. 
directly through me. If you want forgiveness, you will not get it through animal sacrifices. You will get it through this sacrifice once and for all, fully paid through me. Just him saying, Father, forgive them. The way is open to forgiveness. It is available. You will get it through me. So here is this dramatic, this dramatic scene in verses 28 through 31. And you remember Jesus prior to his crucifixion, this is Luke 23, going through the streets and remember, here's all the, the women mourning and lamenting after him and, and he's saying, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. Imagine him saying this. Why? Because he's looking off into the vast distance and he's seeing what's going to come at the destruction of the temple, and he's seeing Titus, he's seeing the Roman general Titus rolling through the streets. Listen, 28,000 Jews are going to die. They're going to burn the temple, the screams. It's, it's going to be horrific. They're just going to burn the people out of the temple. Um, just thousands are going to die. And he says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. And then what does it say? And then they will begin to say unto the mountains, fall. this is all idiomatic. In other words, there's no hope left. There's no hope. They could say to the mountains, fall on us. And to the hills, cover us. Because there's no hope. You see, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Because there's going to come a day when all of your opportunity for mercy is going to run past. The clock is going to run out. There's going to be no hope any longer. You know, there's a great thing about hope. There's a great thing about opportunity. There's a great thing when somebody says, it's yours for the taking. Just, just take it. It's free. It's here. But to be on the other side of that, to be on the other side of that is a scary, scary, scary thing. And that's what Jesus is talking about. For if they do these things in the, when the tree is green, what will happen when it's, when it's dry? And he's saying, look, you know, um, if, if all this is taking place, look how they're treating me, he's saying. This righteous one that you love, look how they're treating me. What do you think they're going, and, and in fact, by comparison, Think of how the conditions were in Jerusalem when they crucified Jesus comparatively to 40 years later. 40 years later, those women, 40 years later, would have saw, seen their children murdered in the streets and the city wiped out. The temple smashed, nothing left. So, Roman soldiers pillaging. All, all that to say that salvation is offered to us, free, forgiveness, grace, mercy, everything paid for, we would be, what's, what's a word um, stronger than foolish? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to say it any more than please <laughs> take, take Jesus up on his offer of forgiveness. Uh, if you can see yourself to be, um, to be a, a sinner, as scripture says, then your sins have been paid for. Uh, and he offers full pardon and forgiveness to you for the, for the asking, if you'll simply hand your life over to him, new life, new life in him um, for the asking. Lord, thank you for, it, it, it seems so shallow, uh, but we don't have any stronger language to express gratitude for what you have done for us and the way that you have done it. You didn't do it with money as if to say, 
Um, here is a pile of money by which we will ransom you from slavery, you, you wicked human beings, but r rather you came and in the most um, heinous uh, fashion were, were put to death and suffered for us, for our sins. And uh, we can express our gratitude that, number one, you would help us see, you know, just, just see um, the reality of that, the full weight of the reality of that, and also help us to appreciate uh, who you are and value that deeply in our lives. Um, and I, I'm so uh, thankful for we that are here, that we can know that, that we can put our faith and trust in you, that we can know the joy of what it is to walk in forgiveness, to walk in the light of your grace, to walk in the assurance of having a savior, uh, to live in the, in the freedom of that relationship and not have to be uh, concerned or shackled with, with guilt and shame. Um, and Lord, we pray for um, those who may be uh, listening, watching um, this morning that they, or, or at whatever time, you know, they may view this, that they too may, may simply fall on their, their knees or wherever they are and ask you, cry out to you for your mercy, knowing, knowing that you turn no one away for whatever we've done. And you've already taken the full weight of our sin upon you and you did it gladly and you did it out of love. Um, and you will receive us as your dear children be because of that love uh, and welcome us into your family and, and keep us there. Uh, forever, and we look forward to, to spending an eternity with you together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.